Please be seated. We'll hear argument in um, 17423, Hay Street Bridge Restoration Group against the City of San Antonio. Court. Ms. Kathy will present argument for the petitioner. The petitioner has reserved five minutes for rebuttal. Good morning. Uh, present in the court this morning are many members of the Hay Street Bridge Restoration Group and members of the Hay Street Bridge Community Coalition. I, uh, there was some concern, and I wanted to mention it, Your Honors, um, that the write-up in the little brochure is not accurate, but that I assure them that that is not this court's understanding of the case. Um, the important issue before the court in, in this case is whether the city was immune from a breach of contract action brought by the Hay Street Bridge Restoration Group. This court has uh, decided several cases involving governmental immunity for municipal entities, and the law has been significantly clarified by these decisions. As you know, there are two parts of the question of whether or not the city had governmental immunity. First, whether the city entered the contract in pursuit of its governmental capacity and therefore whether it was clothed with derivative governmental immunity from the state. Um, the Court of Appeals said yes, it had immunity. The second part of the uh, issue, of course, is if the city was acting in a governmental capacity and had derivative governmental immunity, was that immunity waived by the uh, Local Government's Contract Claims Act? On the question of whether or not the city had governmental immunity, the court specifically addressed this question in Wasson 2, which was decided on June 1st of this year, before, or I'm sorry, after we had completed <coughs> briefing on the merits. So we didn't have an opportunity to discuss that case and to apply what the court announced as a four-part test. So I would like to go over that and one of the, the first exhibit that we've distributed is the Wasson 2 decision. And in that case, Justice uh, Boyd, writing for the court, announced a four-part test to determine whether or not when the city of San Antonio entered the contract with the Hay Street Bridge Restoration Group, it was acting in a governmental or a proprietary function. The first of the tests is whether the city's act in entering this fundraising contract was mandatory or discretionary. Clearly, the city decided and suggested and um, drafted this memorandum of understanding, the contract in this case, um, in order to uh, help them um, gather resources for the Hay Street Bridge restoration project. This was a discretionary decision. It was um, merely that they wanted to have a source of funding. Um, was the funding, uh, the second part of the four part test is whether the fundraising agreement intended to benefit the general public or the city's residents. Clearly the purpose of this fundraising contract was to generate resources for the city and that was to benefit the city. Would the public uh, derive any benefit from that though? Not from the fundraising contract itself, no. It was purely for the purpose of supplementing the city's um, resources. Explain that more because it really seems that that was to benefit the there, public. There's no doubt. There's no doubt that the work of the Hay Street Bridge Restoration Group was intended by the group to benefit the public. That's what, that's what they did. They worked uh, before and after the contract doing that. But the contract that the city required of the Hay Street Bridge Restoration Group required the restoration group to continue its the best efforts to raise funds, both cash and in-kind donations, for the Hay Street Bridge Restoration Project. So from the city's perspective, what it was seeking was fundraising services. Um, so, is that? Yeah? Well, I, I mean, I understand so, your argument. Yeah, that's that's all. Um, so, and that was really what was undertaken by the group was generating funds. 
um, soliciting donations of cash, soliciting donations. When the project started, when the contract was entered, the city didn't even own the bridge. So it was the Hastry Bridge Restoration Group that negotiated and, and convinced Union Pacific, along with the city, who was their partner by this time, um, to donate the bridge. How does the group define its primary purpose? It, the primary purpose of the group is to have to preserve and um, uh, maintain the Hay Street Bridge for the purpose of educating and promoting the community identity. The Hay Street Bridge is both a historic engineering monument as well as a cultural monument for San Antonio's east side, the traditionally African-American part of San Antonio. So their, their um, motive in entering into this contract surely was to benefit the community, um, but the city's motive was to generate um, funds. But where's that distinction? Because everything that you're saying to me sounds like it's very beneficial to the public. The historical significance of this very important project and where's the distinction? Um, the city normally would um, restore and maintain historic properties as part of their normal functioning. In this case, they required the Hay Street Bridge Restoration Group to generate resources for this uh, preservation, to obtain the bridge and then to preserve it. Um, so. The, you know, yes, the city, in, in agreeing to preserve the Hay Street Bridge, agreed for the public, and the public benefited from that. But when the city said, we will require you to do fundraising services, and in exchange, we promise that whatever resources are generated by you will be allocated to the Hay Street Bridge Restoration Project. So it's that contract that's in dispute, that separate fundraising contract, which, yes, the Hay Street Bridge Restoration Group agreed to that contract because of its, it was part of their larger mission. But the city didn't have to do that in order to preserve the, the, uh, the bridge. The reason they entered into that fundraising contract was simply to generate funds. But, and but it's likely the project would not have been Preserved, but for that, correct? Well, here's here's what happened. The History Bridge Restoration Group, um, you know, uh, searched for resources, identified the possibility of a federal grant, um, um, generate, you know, got pro bono services uh, committed to um, preparing an application for that grant. The convinced the city to join on that application. The federal government. Um, the grant was, a, was awarded for a $2.9 million grant. And the city, at that point, said, well, we're not going to accept that grant unless the Hay Street Bridge Restoration Group agrees to uh, give us fundraising services. Um, but that's not a normal practice. There's no, the, the city says, oh, this is like other projects, but it's not true. We were unable to find any other instance in which the city required a fundraising contract with a, with a community organization. So they went out, they did something unusual, the city, entering into this contract. And the reason for it was they didn't want to commit any money to this um, preservation of the bridge. The, the exchange, the promise that the city made in exchange for the group's promise to provide these services was to uh, dedicate any funds raised to this project, right? Was it also to create the park or to use this property as the park? Was, um, that, was that a promise made in consideration for the group services? That was not a part of the original contract, no. Um, what, what was, um, it, it's clear that the original contract, and as the jury found, uh, the word funds includes both, both cash and in-kind donations. It's clear from the very beginning that there was a contemplated in-kind donations in the form of land and the bridge and other such resources. 
Um, but no, the availability of this piece of land to be a place for the, for the visitor center and all of that um, didn't come up until afterwards. And it's my understanding there's a fact issue as to whether the group was whether the donation of this piece of land was the result of the group's efforts versus something the city did on its own? Uh, no, Your Honor. There's no, no fact issue on that? It's, everybody agrees that um, the group generated The group stuff. generated it. If we disagree with you and, and believe that there is governmental immunity here, can you address whether that immunity has been waived? Absolutely. Um, under the um, Local Government Co uh, Contracts Act, um, as you know, um, this is a service contract covered by, um, by that act under section 152, that is uh, uh, 271.152. Um, governmental immunity is waived um, for contracts subject to this act. And it says for the purpose of adjudicating. Um, and uh, so. But you're seeking specific performance, right. and there is an argument that that can never be part well, of the, the uh, Yes. And I've included in the back of uh, Exhibit 3 is the complete um, act, and Exhibit um, 2 is the version of Section 153 that applies to this case. There have been various amendments, and that's the one that applies here. Um, as I said, the waiver, the provision, and, and this is drawing on this court's decision in Zachary, which, which really sorted out the interaction and the interplay between section 152 and 153. 152 waives immunity subject to the other limitations in the act, including section 153. So the um, Court of Appeals looked at section 153, which again you have um, in the exhibits, and said, well, 153 prohibits any um, action that does not include a um, request for money damages. And the court then said the only money damages sought were specific performance, and therefore immunity was not waived. Um, that's an incorrect reading incorrect on contract law and incorrect on the statute. Contract law, as you know, allows alternative remedies. One is monetary damages, compensatory damages, and the other is specific performance. Most cases seek monetary damages, and indeed, specific performance is not available if there is a reasonable and an adequate monetary award. Um, whether or not it's, it's, it's granted or whatever. In this case, this is one of those rare cases in which monetary damages are not adequate to remedy the group's um, injury. The group sought to better the community. They didn't seek a payment for their fundraising services. What injury, uh, what injury is left? The uh, city says the project's been completed, and uh, the property's been sold, and the funds were credited to uh, the city's involvement, the city's funding, so there's nothing left. Well, um, the project is not complete. There is no uh, visitor center. There is no place for parking of, of school buses and other people, visitors to the um, to the bridge. There are no restroom facilities. There are none of the facilities that the project threw out, and this was um, clear in the evidence at trial, that there was always an assumption that this land would be used as a visiting center. But let me take a step back from that and just focus, if I will, on the city's motion um, uh, to dismiss. The, the affidavit tendered with that um, motion gives you no time, no personal knowledge. I, I assume that what they're referring to, as your, as your Honor said, the sale of the land, I'm assuming that that was a sale that happened before the city filed its notice of appeal. Okay, so, 
So apparently the city, after four years of an appellate litigation, is now saying that this court case was moved before we filed our notice of appeal. But we don't know because the affidavit doesn't tell you when any of the events that it talks about. Moreover, as I said, it doesn't, it doesn't tell you anything other than that this affid, uh, declarant is familiar with this project. Well, a lot of people are familiar with the project. Um, I think she says that the land was sold to the Alamo Beer Company. We have not yet had post-judgment discovery to which we are entitled, but I assume that they're talking about a transfer that happened in 2014, but the public records show that that transfer was not to the Alamo Beer Company, as it says in the affidavit, but to the Seymour, Texas Land Company. So on its face, the affidavit is inaccurate, at least as far as the public records are concerned. Moreover, she says, well, this money was taken and allocated to the project. But a few months later, after the sale of this land, we see a check for the exact amount written to the Alamo Beer Company. Uh, we don't know, and we're entitled to discovery on what happened. First of all, what, what time period is the court, is the city talking about? Was it before they even filed a notice of appeal, in which case it's really <coughs> problematic? But second of all, um, really, other than Lori Houston, we are entitled to see what was done with the money. Ms. Castle, your time has expired. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Thank you. We'll hear from the uh, city. May it please the court, Mr. Truesdale and Mr. Poza will present arguments for the respondent. Mr. Truesdale will open with the first five minutes. May it please the court. Petitioner's brief in this case concludes with the following statement, and it's in repetitive briefs, but the statement is, the only thing left to be done in this case is for the city to perform the part of the contract that it was ordered to do so in the judgment. Justice Heck, you just asked what relief is left to be performed in this case, and the answer to that is in the judgment itself. This case is not about a park. The judgment was not about a park. The judgment in this case ordered as follows. It says, it is therefore ordered and decreed that the city of San Antonio shall allocate, apply, and use all funds raised by Plaintiff Hayes Street Bridge Restoration Group by applying said funds. Did the city complete the project as envisioned? There, there were a recitation of a litany of things that weren't completed. Well, yes, the, the city has completed all that. But here's the most important part. What did the judgment require us to do? Okay, the judgment required us to apply and allocate funds. And the funds that are at issue in this case are the funds that were generated from the property. Okay, the fund, you know, property, a piece of, a portion of property can't be applied to a budget. The funds that are generated from the sale of a property can be uh, allocated to a budget, and that's what happened here. Now, the reason I'm focusing on the judgment, obviously, is that's what we have to show that we've satisfied. But more importantly, not only is the relief that the judgment granted important, what the relief the judgment did not grant is equally important because the claims in this case that involved any allegations about the use of the property as a park were denied by the jury. The jury found that the property was not held, owned, used, or held as a park, and accordingly the trial court denied injunctive or de declaratory relief that had anything to do with the, with the property as used as a park. Center fall within the ambit of park. A visitor center, theoretically, does that fall within park? I mean, is that part of a park or is that a well, standalone? That's not. Uh, with, with respect, the the question is: Is the property held as a park? And the property was not held as a park. And when the judgment says the property is held as funds, okay, um, and you must allocate the funds as the agreement yeah, yeah, says you must, then the question is: Did we do what the judgment said that we must do? And the question is answered by the affidavit that says we... It's not an affidavit. By the declaration, Your Honor. I'm sorry. Uh, but it, it says that the funds that were generated from the sale of the property were so allocated. And that's dispositive. When do you assert that happened? After the sale of the property. And, the, and here's an, another point uh, that, that's important because it has to do with the distinction between Alamo mm -hmm. Brewing or the Seymour Company. Um, 
bottom line is that in every pleading that the uh, petitioners filed in the trial court, you know, they complained that the city of San Antonio had put an ordinance out to sell this property to Alamo Brewing Company, quote, or its affiliates. And the record shows that the affiliate is Seymour, which is the owner of Alamo Brewing Company. So if there's a, if there's a deviation between the, the names, the names are consistent with respect to the relationships of the parties. And that's not, that's even beside the point in any event, because there's no dispute that the property was sold. The, How so is it? on December 4th, uh, 2014, and this is 2018, so when does the city assert that the judgment was complied with? Uh, in, in 2014, after the sale. Well, and along the same lines, it's, it's just striking that if your position is that you satisfied the judgment in 2014, what were you doing for all those years litigating the, the case? That, that's a very good question. And the, and the answer is, is that when this case was, when we sought the appeal and we were pursuing a, a judgment reversing uh, a plea to the jurisdiction that denied our claim to governmental immunity uh, in connection with the specific performance claim, we wanted a judgment on that. We wanted to get that taken care of. And the, the other fact is, Justice Blacklock, is that throughout the history of this litigation, particularly on appeal, the petitioner's position has been somewhat of a moving target with respect to its interpretation of what the judgment imposed upon us, what duties it imposed, what relief it was afforded. You know, I noted this in the motion to dismiss that we filed. Uh, throughout the history of this case, and and to this day at this argument, the city still cannot, or the group does not identify what relief it wants in the event that it prevails in this court. So did you recently discover that you satisfied the judgment, or, is your, or did you know all along you satisfied the judgment and you were seeking, still seeking an opinion in your favor from the Court of Appeals? When, the question of when we discovered that, uh, or when it, when it occurred to counsel that the judgment had been satisfied and the case was moved, that's a... Uh, um, that's a different question. But the bottom line point is, is that once we discovered that, we filed our motion, uh, and, and the consequences of that motion, whether we knew about it in uh, 2015 or we knew about it in August of 2018, the consequences are that it determines the fact that the judgment has been satisfied. And if the judgment has been satisfied, um, there's no relief left to be granted. And I just asked the court to consider, if this court reverses the immunity ruling and sends this case back, what more is there to be done? The, the petitioner asks in the briefing, you know, all that is left to be done is what is ordered by the judgment. And our contention is everything that the judgment ordered us to do has been done, and this dispute is moot. Nothing in the... <coughs> Any other questions? <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Trinkel. Mr. Posen, we'll hear from you. <coughs> Uh, Justice Boyd, to your question, uh, the Court of Appeals did not reach uh, underlying factual disputes on the merits. For instance, uh, the city has always contended that the 803 North Cherry property was donated, but not by the efforts of the group. So you, you, you contend, the city contends there's a fact issue on whether the group generated that donation. And, and, we, and if, if, in fact, your, if, in fact, the group did not generate the donation, then uh, the property not, not, doesn't fall within the MOU at all. We believe the property doesn't fall within the MOU just based on the judgment itself. Uh, but independently of that, we do not believe that this land that was donated was donated by them. We do not believe that the land is funds under the memorandum uh, that could go through the San Antonio Area Foundation that could be, uh, that could be used. We do agree that uh, if it is those things, uh, to Mr. Truesdale's point, if it is those things, we've done that. Uh, we don't By allocating the, the sale price to the budget. In effect, really, I mean, money is... Money. You contend that there was never any contractual obligation on the part of the city, to uh, contractual obligation to the group, to build the park or to use the property for a park. Exactly. We believe our obligations are limited to the document, the memorandum. But the, but the MOU refers to the Hay Street Bridge project, which was described in the uh, grant application to the federal government, which included a park and the parking and all of that, right? 
Uh, not that we know of. I mean, the parking and all that never came up. And and I guess if I could sort of roll it back into our sort of Watson 2 analysis, uh, if you look at uh, the ordinance, if you look at the undisputed testimony, the author of the memorandum, if you look at the memorandum itself, and then if you look at, finally, the city-state contract that actually creates the funding and creates the, the project itself. If you start with the May 2001 ordinance, it describes uh, exactly, this is, the, this is sort of the enabling an ordinance that sort of got everybody on board together, both the group and the city. And it talks about uh, what was then called neighbor, neighborhoods acting together with the planning department of a study of the potential uses of the historic Hay Street Bridge. It's envisioned in that ordinance that there is going to be an application made through the state of Texas, the statewide transportation enhancement program. This is going to be a state project. Uh, the bridge is an instance of, an instantiation of, this sort of broader statewide project. It's not even a question of going to the Tort Claims Act and finding, you know, bridge for the city. Uh, that there's going to be this called TEA 21 application process. The scope of work is determined. The scope of work has nothing to do with anything other than the bridge itself and the restoration of the bridge, rehabilitation of the bridge. And indeed, uh, this has nothing to do with the, the dichotomy issue, but I think it's important in that ordinance uh, it states, uh, whereas approval of this ordinance will support initiatives of the downtown strategic plan, the downtown neighborhood plan, the master plan, and CRAG, as well as freeing up lands for new development, including residential development, just adjacent to the bridge. So public policy-wise, the bridge was maybe the jewel in the crown. Public policy-wise, the bridge is the project uh, that's the governmental project. But the city's looking at both the importance of that and the overall development of trying to have development, in particular residential development, on the east side. So I end residential development or residential development that's going to benefit lower income communities. It, there's no question that outside of the bridge project, the other things that were going on would be considered, I mean, they're nothing to do with the memorandum, but would be sort of proprietary interest the city would have in the east side next to the bridge, and the bridge sort of forming the basis. That was sort of their public policy. I, it's not a dichotomy issue, but it's sort of like looking, I guess what I would say is uh, the group, or there may be other citizens, I mean, there is not unanimity. Uh, there is, a, lo there is a, a large number of east side residents that are very favoring the, the development that's going on right now. There's a group that disagrees with that, so that's not atypical. Uh, but the one thing that I don't think the group can say is they can't claim surprise or shock that it would be used for residential development on the land adjacent to the bridge, when since 2001, that was sort of the public policy of the city. Well, see, since you brought up the policy, that's what I'm just trying to determine whether, in the end, the, the low-income residents actually benefit <coughs> from what's actually taking place. The low-income residents will be benefiting, presumably, uh, by what the bridge attracts as far as development. So that's the idea. I mean, City of San Antonio also thought the Alamo Dome on the east side would have that same benefit. I don't think that's proven to be what their expectations were. Uh, we are seeing residential development now uh, in the land that was sold, as a matter of fact, on 803 North Cherry, that is residential development it's intended to be. And I only bring that up to have the larger context of, of where this is fitting in. But before we get to the dichotomy <coughs> issue, um, it, going back through our cases, this court's cases from IT Davy and Cook and Federal Sign and all, all, all the late 90s, 2000 cases, the court repeatedly referred to sovereign or governmental immunity as barring suits against the government for money damages. And it seems like lately we've sort of blurred that a little bit, uh, but I, it seems to me that there's a preliminary question to be answered, does immunity even apply to a claim that does not seek money damages? And I wonder if that's something you've looked at and does your client have a position on? Your Honor, one of, I mean, obviously one of the motivating factors for us was since, remember that the city is going to be paying the 20 percent, whether they make it all up, whether they're short, money's fungible, we paid, uh, we paid that. What was important to us was uh, the fact that a trial court had, had, had said that we had to specific before, specifically perform that very thing. And we thought we had immunity from that. Uh, they brought the suit under 271, and we said, you won't find the remedy in 271. We have immunity for that. 
the, and whether you look at the 271 issue as the Austin Court of Appeals did in the West Travis County public utility case, where because there there's no money like ours due and owing uh, under the contract, is this really even something that's captured? Is this contract even captured by or subject to the act? Uh, in that case, Judge Justice Pemberton had a concurrence and dissent, basically a couple of lines that went off in the second question. That is, is there a remedy for which there's waiver? So uh, although our Court of Appeals and our briefing focus on what unpacked, if you will, what Justice Pemberton had had is his concurrence and dissent. He comes out in the same place, but for a different reason. Uh, although we unpack that, you could say the same thing uh, uh, is true in this case. That is, is this claim for a specific performance where there's really no obligation, there's no right that we have to their services under the memorandum. Uh, they're using their best efforts. There's no liability if they fail to use their best efforts. If they fall short in their fundraising, uh, there's no liability. It's, it's basically uh, sort of rolling it back into the Wasson 2. The reason why the, mem the only reason the memorandum exists, its only reason for existence is to make sure the bridge project happens. And is that's true. I'm sorry. I was just going to ask before you move on, on damages and remedies available under the statute, are there any remedies available? I mean, for there waiver? wouldn't be any remedies in this case uh, because there's no money damages owed, even if cause you'd have to rewrite the memorandum and it'd have to be a different document. Uh, of course, the majority in the Austin Court of Appeals uh, looked at essential terms, essential terms under the contract, under the act, have to include things such as the amount owed. Now, as I understand, the group's argument on that issue is the Act has specific damage items that are waived, and the Act goes uh, to the additional trouble of specifically saying those things that aren't, those damage elements that aren't waived, and therefore, in specific performance, is not captured in any either of those boxes, so somehow it's there. So they characterize it as a remedy, not necessarily an element of damages for a breach of contract action. Right. And I think uh, it's, it's uh, they sort of want to impose, well, it's just, you know, we know in contract law, if, if money damages are inadequate, one can go to specific performance, fine for contract law, but that has nothing to do with the immunity issue. And so, in effect, they say, since the legislature took that, as I understand, maybe their best argument, or at least their attempt at what I would consider their best argument would be, well, here's, an ex here's the uh, waiver uh, for balance due and owing, uh, things of that nature. Here's the exclusion. Here's some things that for sure don't count uh, as being waived, consequential damages and such. And so, well, gosh, there's no mention of specific performance, so they must have intended that because they know what contract law is. Well, they may know what contract law is, and... Uh, and not want to waive specific performance. So I don't think if we're going to maintain a clear and unambiguous waiver standard that that implicitness is going to count. Uh, I would say, I would just add, uh, uh, in volume five of the reporter's record, uh, the group called as a witness Nina Nixon Mendez. She's the author of the memorandum. This is undisputed testimony, and it helps corroborate, harmonize both the ordinance and the memorandum and ultimately the city-state contract. Uh, in that, just briefly, in that testimony, uh, she says, this is a memorandum of understanding that was drafted in conjunction with a proposal that was sent to council for funding of the Hay Street Bridge. And uh, she is asked, she says, I was asked to prepare a memorandum of understanding by our planning director, Emil Masavias, who's the one who signed it, I was manager for the neighborhood division at the time, and that was a role I assumed with other neighborhood groups that we that we worked with in developing memorandum of understanding. She's describing how this isn't the first time that's been done. And she says, I was being asked to prepare this because the Hay Street Bridge Restoration Group wanted the city to apply for the federal funding, the T21 enhancement funds. And it was our planning director's belief that it would be important to demonstrate to city council in submitting this grant application that the Hay Street Bridge Group showed that they were interested in raising funds towards the project as well. The question's asked, and did the city go out looking for somebody to do the fundraising for the city to do that 20% match? No, no. Again, the idea behind the memorandum of understanding was that the group was already working on the fundraising, and we just wanted to sort of crystallize the understanding that we had with them when we presented the contract for council. They were interested in raising the match, the cash match for the project, and so that's why we sat down and drafted the memorandum of understanding. 
the, uh, that's drafted and signed by the group and by the city on June 4, 2002. The next month, it does work, it is effective. The next month, the city signs the contract with the state. That had been signed by the state in January 2002. It was on the mayor's desk, if you will, or the city manager's desk for some number of months. The memorandum is the inducement uh, to a city with limited resources on infrastructure projects on what this one works. And so, uh, yes, I would say uh, citizen lobbying was effective, and they thought that this would help, help as well. There's no, uh, and that's why the memorandum of understanding is rather cavalier about best efforts, no liability. It's really just sort of this, uh, it's really asking a community that has been involved, continue to be involved, uh, uh, to assure the decision makers at the city that they would continue to be involved. They wouldn't say mission accomplished and walk away. Anything that would keep that involvement was important. It was important to the policymakers in deciding uh, what infrastructure projects get the green light and which ones don't. So I don't think, I think the evidence is clear. And if you look at the memorandum of understanding, every paragraph is tagged to the project. Every paragraph in that contract is, is tagged to uh, the Hay Street Bridge project. In the scope of the project, if you look at the city-state contract, the scope of the project and the memorandum of understanding is strictly the bridge and its rehabilitation. There's no reference to anything outside of that project. Well, but the jury found otherwise. They did. And, and assuming, we don't, assuming we don't have immunity, that's what we're addressing. That's what we were going to address with the Court of Appeals uh, that they didn't reach, was that this has nothing to do with... Uh, this has nothing to do with other things. But, but right now in front of this court, we accept the jury's findings and the, the trial court's judgment based on those findings uh, without trying to go behind that and question that. We're, we're all stuck with that right now. It's just a question of whether there was immunity. Right. But what we're stuck with is a judgment that will never give them what they want. I mean, they're not appellants below. They're not cross appellants below. They can't touch that judgment. Their problem is, their problem always has been, continues to be, the motion to dismiss sort of ferrets it out for this court. Their problem and their position has always been, they don't like the judgment that was entered. They think they have jury findings that should give them different, better relief. They never filed a notice of appeal. There is a uh, sanctions motion pending against the city of San Antonio right now that whenever it goes, if it goes back and the judgment's in place, uh, they will be trying to hold the city in contempt for doing what? For doing the very thing that the judgment itself says that we have to do. Uh, because they have a different interpretation. They believe either there was an oral agreement on the side that that needs to be flushed out and added to a judgment, which would have been a nice notice of appeal point that they would have had to bring up because it's more relief than they got. Or they believe and sometimes say that the judgment is ambiguous and once the court clarifies the trial court judgment, changes that judgment, then we're going to be held in contempt for what the, for what the judgment will say. But all, all that is yet to be decided. If, if we agree with your motion to dismiss that this, this petition is moot because you've sat at, the city has satisfied its obligations under the judgment, then we dismiss this case and it, it gets active again in the Court of Appeals on all that you've just described. Well, if the case is dismissed, I presume it's dismissed across the board because although we still don't, we still say that we they did not donate the land. We still say that the land can't be used as funds. We in fact did that. We we you know assume it assume it was you know our our position is well assume it was donated. Assume we're wrong about that. Assume they brought the donation. Assume that land can be funds, and assume that land doesn't have to go to the San Antonio Air Foundation like the document says. Assume all of that in their favor. We've done that very thing, is what we're saying. Any other questions? Thank, Thank you, Mr. Poza. <coughs> Ms. Cassidy, you have five minutes. I would like to say this is the first time that I've heard that there's a contested motion or contested fact about whether or not the Hastry Bridge Restoration Group solicited the land. Uh, talk about a moving target. Um, I wanted to just, uh, Justice Guzman, the, the project, what the city is now doing, all along this has been about a sweetheart deal. It's been about giving this land along with the money to uh, a, a close friend of the former mayor. That's what it's about. The project is going to have uh, housing for the wealthy. 
that will have a beautiful view Should of the bridge. Should that have anything to do with our decision? I don't in this think case? so. I don't think so. I just wanted to give if you. If it's the... low income or wealthy or a good policy or a bad policy, has nothing to do with what this court's deciding. Yes. At this I point, but council did mention public policy that sort of surrounded the circumstances. So to that extent, thank you for that clarification. Thank you, Justice. Um, and Justice Boyd, you asked whether immunity applies if no money is sought. I looked into that question. It's not answered. Um, it, it certainly one of the justifications, current justifications for immunity is that it saves the, the public uh, fisk. Uh, I assume that, um, that uh, if it does apply, it would rely on the second justification, which has to do with not binding the state in the future. But um, as far as I know, that has not been decided by this court. Um, I wanted to say that the, the motion to dismiss rests on two very flawed legal arguments. Um, one is that the judgment has a plain meaning of funds, which is not the same meaning that the jury found for that word. So the interpretation of the judgment is, is something that the, begins with the district court and then can be appealed later on. But we filed a motion to show cause why the city should not be held in contempt in 2014. All of the issues that the city is now bringing to you to decide have been waiting for resolution in a hearing before the district court. Um, and the same with the interpretation of judgment. We're entitled to have, to have the um, judgment interpreted as any contract or any other piece of legislation would be interpreted. Um, so, so that's flawed. The second one is this novel idea that the jury finding on the, that the city did not own, claim, or hold the land as a park somehow binds us from rescission of a transfer that was made in violation of the judgment. Now, let me say, there were two claims initially in this case, the breach of contract and a secondary claim under local government code section 253, which has to do with when a, when a municipality transfers a piece of land that is, quote, owned, held, or claimed as a park. And the remedy for that is, if it's done that, then there has to be an election held by the um, populace. Okay? Um, at, at trial, or in, in the beginning of the trial, um, we had to decide whether to go forward. Our name plaintiff in that action was, um, was ill at the time. And second of all, that's not the remedy we've ever wanted in this case. So that was the only reason for that jury finding. And yes, the jury found, in other words, that this land, prior to the trial, prior to 2010, prior to 2012, was not held by the city as a park. We knew that. It wasn't part of the park um, uh, you know, uh, list of properties. That's not the point. And it certainly doesn't preclude, it doesn't preclude the district court from finding that a transfer in violation of the judgment has to be rescinded. What they do next is up to them. But we're entitled to a hearing on our motion to show cause. And we have a remedy available. And that is that this actually comply with the judgment. Um, I, excuse me. Um, the other point is the relationship to the bridge and the, um, the public benefit. And that goes to the question of whether or not the city was acting in its governmental or its proprietary function here. I think it's worth uh, cautioning um, and, and recognizing, as this court has done repeatedly in its decisions, that the Texas Court Tort Claims Act list of governmental um, uh, functions was expanded for the purpose of bringing more of the municipal actions under the caps in the Tort Claims Act, or the, the Tort Reform Act, what it was. Um, and Yes, that, this court has said that list can be guidance for courts, but the question of whether governmental immunity exists in the first place is one for the judiciary. The, there was a constitutional amendment empowering the, the legislature to define the scope of governmental immunity for all purposes, but they haven't done that. They've only defined it for the purposes of tort claims not for the purposes of contract claims. 
And so even if this, well, that's one point. The second point is in the Wasson II that you all decided just recently, the, the, this court said a proprietary action that is that touches on or, or, or in some ways uh, involved with a, a governmental action is not to be treated as a governmental function unless it is essential to that purpose. So that goes to whether or not this contract was essential to a governmental purpose for the city. Any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Castelli. The case is submitted, and the court will take another brief recess. All rise. Thank you.